So, we all know that Mother Nature is wise. If she blesses some creature with a particular body part, it should make perfect sense, right? Well, yeah, but still, some wildlife shots make you wonder if evolution has gone the wrong way. Snakes' natural design allows them to swallow a whole mouse. But in some cases, this cool ability can turn against them. Yes, snakes can actually swallow themselves. Scientists believe that they mostly do this because of stress, captivity, temperature regulation, hunger, or illness. The snake is pretty helpless in this situation, you can tell. If it doesn't get help in time, digestive juices may begin to corrode the swallow tail. So if you ever catch your pet snake doing this, try to stop it or take it to the vet. Okay, but what about the fangs, I hear you ask? Does a venomous snake have immunity to its own venom? Well, if the snake digests it, it will be okay. It's because protein is a primary component in venom. And besides, the venom is excreted by the gland in the snake's mouth. So no matter whom the snake bites, chances are that it's going to drink a bit. So the only way a snake can actually suffer from its own venom is by biting itself straight into the blood vessel. In this case, it'll experience the same reaction as any other animal. Now, think you're having a bad hair day? Hey, check this guy out. Chris was an Australian merino ram who became a celebrity in 2015 after being discovered in the wild. Farmers shorn him and gained nearly 90 pounds of wool. When the animal was found, he carried over five years' worth of fleece on his body. But Chris belonged to the domestic sheep breed that needs to be shorn regularly. Otherwise, the animal is at great risk of injury and infection. So the lives of these cuties depend directly on going to the hairdresser. Shall we talk about horns? Cattle, goats, and many other species proudly wear this fancy headdress not only for fashion, but also as a weapon for brutal battles. If you ask this bighorn sheep ram directly how old he is, you'll probably hear something like, bah. But if you want to get a more precise answer, you can count the number of rings on his horns. The biggest and the darkest ring usually marks the fourth birthday, when the ram matures enough for mating. Although animal horns may look very tough, in fact, most of them are made of keratin. It's the same protein that builds human hair and nails. Horns never stop growing as the animal ages, just like our own hair. And eventually, they can curl into really extravagant shapes, making these weapons turn against their owners. This is what a Wilshire sheep horn looks like when it's young. But as the years go by, the horns typically curl in front of its face. And while most grow out harmlessly, the inward-growing horns can end up dangerously close to the sheep's head. Like this ram who's having bad luck, to say the least. Its horn has slowly grown into its own skull, and eventually, well, it didn't end well for the sheep. Of course, this would hardly have happened on a farm, because people would have made a preventive horn cut. But unfortunately, in the wild, animals cannot use hairdresser services. That's why they use rocks and branches to rub and grind away at their horns to keep them safe, just like humans trim their nails. Faulty genetics is not the only reason for the horn distortion. You see, when males of the species want to fight for dominance, they begin to butt heads to show each other who's the alpha male here. Mm -hmm. These battles can break horn plates, making them grow at weird and dangerous angles. The fancier the original shape of the horns is, the more problems their fracture may cause. This poor African kudu is a bright example. Fortunately, in some cases, unlimited body part growth can be good for the animal. Just take a look at these adorable smiles. If you happen to break off your own molar tooth, your dentist would probably say it's irreversible and offer a replacement. But if an alpaca breaks its front teeth, all it has to do is wait a bit. Although these animals don't have upper teeth, their lower teeth constantly grow throughout their lifetime. And they might look pretty creepy when they get too long. That's why some farmers prefer trimming them from time to time. Just like pet owners cut the nails of their cats or dogs. Now llamas look so similar to alpacas that many people confuse these two species. But the significant difference between them is that llamas' front teeth are encased in enamel. That's why, unlike alpacas, they don't possess the superpower of limited growth. Eh, too bad. 
Unlike the keratin horns, deer antlers are made entirely of bone. Typically, only male deers, called stags, grow antlers. Very rarely, females can grow them too due to a serious hormone imbalance. This is a deer equivalent of a beard on a human female that sometimes can appear due to various diseases. Adult deers grow and shed their antlers annually, which coincides with the breeding season. At first, their antlers are covered in velvet, a protective skin with blood vessels. But once the antler is fully developed, the deer gets rid of the velvet, just like snakes shed their skin. Although this process doesn't harm the deer, it may look pretty spooky. Once the brand new antlers are ready, stags begin to fight with other males over the ladies' attention. Usually stags barely eat or sleep during this competition. And if you ever question whether the antlers of two deers can get locked together, the answer is yes. Every stag is risking ending up stuck with his own rival instead of having a romantic night out with a female deer. Bummer. Moreover, all the traumas that the deer gets during the mating season can influence further antler growth if specific nerves get damaged. Just like horns, antlers can develop at distorted angles because of genetic failures. Some mutations can even make them grow monstrously large. This unlucky deer can barely move his head without losing balance. Also, if a deer breaks one of its legs, its body can speed up the healing by sacrificing the bone and blood material from one of the antlers. And thus, this antler will get thinner and weaker. And speaking of facial extensions, we cannot skip the tusks. Please meet Babarusa from Indonesia. This ancient boar first emerged over 35,000 years ago. It's easy to confuse these big tusks with horns, but they are actually upper canines. They tend to pierce through the skin of the boar's face as it matures. Scientists believe that these intimidating tusks have evolved as a tool to protect eyes and throat while fighting with other males during mating season. But this design doesn't seem very thoughtful. If a male boar doesn't grind his tusks regularly, they can end up curling back into his own skull, which can blind him or even worse. Now, what if I told you that hoofs can grow out of control just like horns and antlers? It took evolution millions of years to turn the middle toe of the animal's foot bone into the hoof. And just like toenails, they tend to grow and curl into creepy shapes if they aren't cut regularly. When donkeys or horses don't have a chance to wear down their hooves naturally by walking on hard surfaces, they tend to overgrow. This makes the animals walk on the balls of their feet and overstretch the tendons, which may result in pain and bone loss. And eventually, they can lose the ability to walk at all. So if you ever come across a horse with curly hooves, consider calling the experts to give it an emergency manicure. Perhaps one of the most obvious questions regarding the undersea world is, can a fish drown in the water? Yup, it can. Although gills are an amazing gift of nature, there are still many factors that may deprive a fish of healthy breathing. When the oxygen level in the water is too low, fish begin to suffocate. But it happens very rarely in the wild. Oxygen deficit usually appears in aquariums that are not washed and replenished often enough. Also, parasites, diseases, and an overall imbalance in water components can cause the fish to drown. And on that note, I need to hoof it on out of here. If you think your folks were too harsh on you, perhaps this list of negligent animals will show you a broader perspective on bad parenting. Female horses, or mares, have a gestation period of about a year. This might sound like a terribly long time, but elephants won't agree with that. They carry their young for up to 22 months before giving birth. Unlike the other animals who prefer to rest waiting for their cub to arrive, for mares, pregnancy means party time. The moment the female horse gets pregnant, she goes for a walk around the herd and mates with every stallion. Although it seems meaningless because she's already pregnant, there's a reasonable explanation. The male horses are pretty proud and aggressive with their rivals. But if a stallion would think that a brand new foal is his, the chances that he will hurt the youngling will fall to zero. So the mare's actual intention is to keep the foal safe by making it impossible for stallions to determine the real father, which is a good mothering quality. That's why mares are at the bottom of our list. 
Female cuckoo birds are famous for abandoning their chicks before even hatching. They simply lay eggs in other birds' nests and leave for good. It's hard to distinguish native eggs from foundlings. That's why the unlucky foster birds incubate them all equally. Meanwhile, cuckoo birds even enjoy their single independent lives. Unfortunately, it's not a win-win deal. The cuckoo chick brings chaos and losses to the foster parents. It grows faster and hatches earlier, making the smaller purebred chicks fall out of the nest. Sparrows are so cute, but don't buy into this innocent little face. A female house sparrow is a good, caring mom, but also a furious stepmother who might terrify even Cinderella. Sparrows are typically monogamous, but sometimes they can have connections outside the native nest. When it happens, a female sparrow can literally figure out the other women that mated with their partner and destroy their nests. Why? Just to make sure the male sparrow will have enough time to father her own offspring. Apparently, they haven't heard of babysitters. Harp seals are dedicated to their pups during the first two weeks, so they can't be called the worst mothers in the animal kingdom. In this short period, they keep their offspring close, nursing and feeding them round the clock. But after that, mother seals say goodbye and leave the younger generation alone on the ice. Seal pups are still very vulnerable because they don't know how to swim, hunt, or protect themselves. They should be at least two months old to learn all those skills. So they spend this time waiting, losing weight, and trying not to get eaten by predators. It's no wonder that only one third of all little seals actually make it through the first year of life. Hamsters are harmless, cuddly, and cute, right? But still, they have one dark secret that can shock their owners if no one warns them. In some cases, hamster females may confuse their own offspring with dinner. Nobody knows exactly why, but scientists have developed several theories. Some suggest that they're trying to replenish nutrients after giving birth. Others claim that mother hamsters might feel stressed and threatened by too large a litter. So this action is a self-protection mechanism in a way. To avoid this sad ending, experts recommend keeping the mother hamster away from any stress and giving her all necessary nutrients. All or nothing is probably the favorite motto of black bears. They usually have two or three cubs at a time. But if a mother bear only has one cub for some reason, she's likely to abandon it, hoping for a larger litter the next year. Why? Probably because raising only one baby isn't worth the effort. That's a strange kind of laziness. And while a black bear cub may increase the chances of survival by having a sibling, pandas follow the opposite tradition. It's hard to admit, but these cute fluffy fellows are pretty negligent parents. Panda mothers usually have twins, but they prefer taking care of only one of them. They will feed and nurse the strongest cub. Meanwhile, the weakest one will be neglected and forced to survive on its own. The explanation for their cruelty is pretty practical. Pandas eat bamboo, but it's not nutritious enough to make milk for both cubs. Even pandas that live in the zoo follow the same tradition of abandonment. But thankfully, zookeepers provide all the cubs with milk equally. Although monkeys usually have the reputation of caring, responsible parents, these little mustache cuties stand out. After a gestation period of around five months, the mother tamarind usually gives birth to twins. And if they happen to fall out of the tree by mistake, she will have the nerve to ignore her own cubs crying. Mm. Some of them can throw the cubs out of the tree voluntarily for unknown reasons. Who knows what hides in those little heads? But not all of them are so cold-hearted. If a mother tamarind is surrounded by a wide social group of strong food providers and protectors, she's likely to take good care of her offspring. But when no one's watching or helping, she can stop making any effort, probably because the cubs won't have a high chance of survival anyway. Although mustache tamarinds look like great pet material, experts claim that these monkeys require more daily commitment and dedication than any other pet. Well, at least you're too heavy to kick out of the tree. Bunnies are usually associated with warm hugs and cuddles. 
but in real life, they're not so gentle when it comes to their own newborns. Rabbit mothers prefer leaving the burrow as soon as they give birth. And these cute little bunnies have to learn to face life challenges on their own. They only interact with their mother for a few minutes a day during feedings. Scientists suggest that the female rabbit abandons her offspring to confuse predators and keep them away. Of course, this method doesn't provide a 100% guarantee. After all, the rabbit mothers don't put much effort into creating a safe shelter for the cubs. They usually build it out in the open. And where's the happy father, I hear you ask? Well, it's recommended to isolate the mother from any male rabbits while she raises the newborns. Unlike the horses, male rabbits will probably not hurt the younglings, but he can impregnate the female rabbit again, even on the same day she gives birth. Reptiles aren't known for being warm and caring creatures, and their practical approach to life extends to their parenting style as well. But long-tailed skinks bring personal boundaries protection to the next level. This mother lizard will eat her own eggs when too many predators gather around her home. She won't make any effort to fight off the danger. Perhaps her philosophy is, if I can't have it, no one will. After the threat is gone, they'll just live on and lay new eggs. The female eagle lays two to three eggs within a week. After around a month of the breeding period, the eaglets finally emerge, but their problems are only getting started. Technically, all eggs have slightly different ages, so they don't hatch simultaneously. And when it comes to sibling competition, black eagles can get pretty aggressive towards younger chicks. The older chicks usually start to peck the younger before they even get the chance to start their lives, probably to reduce the competition for food and space. But the eagle mommy won't bother to pull apart her chicks, even if their fight leads to serious injuries. She would neither scold the winner nor save the loser. Apparently, her indifferent attitude should prepare the chicks for the harsh life of an adult eagle. After all, it's a bird of prey, and it keeps the habit of hunting mammals and other birds at their nests throughout life. You work in a large nature reserve that's home to more than a thousand species of animals. At night, you drive through the territory in a jeep to see if everything's okay. Most of the animals are sleeping. Suddenly, you hear the monkeys screaming. They jump from branch to branch. A herd of horses runs out of the forest. They look worried too. You hear many animals crying. Looks like some unknown strange thing has woken up and horrified the whole reserve. You see a flash in the night sky. It's a meteorite and it's flying right towards you. You get in the car, hit the gas and drive away as far as possible. The space rock falls right in front of you and throws your vehicle to the side you pass out. The fallen meteorite emits some strange yellow energy. You're inside an overturned car, unconscious. All the animals have calmed down. Thousands of them silently approach the meteorite. Its energy envelops you and all the animals around. The more energy comes out, the smaller the space stone becomes. By the morning, the meteorite dissolves in the air. It has absorbed the animal powers and pass them on to you. You wake up in the grass near the car, surrounded by several people. These are the reserve employees and some guys in black suits. They study the crater in the ground and ask you what happened. You tell them about the meteorite and they order you to go with them. One of them grabs you tightly by the shoulder. You don't like it and you want to break out. Two men in black are holding you. You get angry and feel your muscles increase, and your skin becomes covered with fur. You quickly push the men away and roar. Your nails have turned into claws. You've received a bear's powers. Now you're just as strong and fierce. Agents in black are following you. You run away into the forest. You want to be faster and feel your spine changing its shape. Now you're running very fast on all fours. You've got the power of a cheetah, the fastest animal on Earth. You're hiding in the forest. The agents are far behind you. You hear a helicopter from above. It shines a bright spotlight beam. Oh no, they've noticed you. Agents use a megaphone to ask you to stop. But you know what awaits you. 
Labs, experiments, life in a cage. You've seen a lot of movies about it, so you won't just give up. You run out of the forest. They release darts at you. You quickly run to a large lake and dive inside. Webbing has grown on your arms and legs. Your feet are like flippers. Your legs fuse into one big tail. And you are now a walrus. You quickly swim across the lake and come ashore on the other side. Several cars and motorcycles are circling the lake to catch up with you. There's another forest ahead, but this time it's too dense. There's not enough space to develop great speed, but you can get the strength of a monkey. Your hands get longer and your fingers become stronger. You jump up a tree, climb to the top and inspect the reserve. You need to go south and get to a small town to eat and drink. After a couple of hours, you reach the reserve's border. Now you have to jump over a high fence. Your legs are getting strong. You jump like a kangaroo, but it's not high enough. You fall to the ground. The helicopter catches up to you. You get lizard powers. You get sticky scales on your palms. You quickly climb the concrete wall and jump to the other side. You find yourself in the tall grass. Agents are coming to you from all sides. You're thinking about a snake. Your arms and legs fuse with your body. Now you can crawl. You pass all the people and find yourself on the road. You see a car in the distance. Raise your hand and ask it to stop. Oh no, it's the agent's vehicle. They surround you. The searchlight from the helicopter is shining right on you. You have nowhere to go. But you don't really have to go. Your clothes tear on your back. Huge wings grow out of your shoulder blades. You rise into the air. It's pretty cold here, but the feathers on your body protect you from the wind. Great, you can fly. It's incredible. Ouch, you feel like someone has pinched you from behind. It's a dart, they got you. You want to sleep and fly down. You make a hard landing near a small wooden house. Agents are running after you. You get the powers of another animal and pass out. People in black are searching the house territory, but can't find you. Maybe the dart with the sleeping pill didn't work on you? After a few minutes, they leave. Meanwhile, you're sleeping peacefully against the wall of the house. At the last second, you managed to get chameleon powers. You merged with the wall and became invisible. You sleep for a couple more hours. The dawn breaks. A rusty rover pulls into the yard. Some old man and a dog come out of there. It runs up to you and starts licking your face. The old man realizes that there's an invisible person in front of him. You come to your senses and tell the old man what happened to you. He gives you some food and clean clothes. You thank him and go away. Now you need to leave the country as soon as possible. You're thinking of a bat. Your legs become overgrown with wings and webbing. You have fangs. You fly without seeing anything. Your eyesight has gotten worse, but your hearing is just fantastic. You have echolocation power and can emit ultrasounds at a high frequency. Somewhere in the distance, you hear a scream of a familiar person. Oh no, it's that old man. The agents attacked him. You turn around and fly straight to the house. One of the agents sees you. He's screaming in terror. You land and think about a rhino. Your body becomes enormous and your nose gets longer. You accelerate and knock down several agents. Then you turn over their car, run into the house and pull out the old man. He gets on your back as you're now a horse and you ride far away from there. You reach the mountains. The old man looks tired but grateful for the adventure. You can't share his joy because you don't know how it will end. You ask the old man to hide while you distract the pursuers. You're thinking of an animal. Your legs and arms turn into hooves. You're jumping up a cliff like a mountain goat. They can't get you here. But at that moment, the helicopter appears again. The agent is aiming a dart at you. Needles are growing on your back. You've got porcupine powers. You release a couple of needles into the agent. It distracts him for a few minutes. At this moment, a cougar jumps at you out of nowhere. It scratches you with its claws. You think about a lion and get its powers. You get on your back feet and growl loudly. The cougar gets scared and runs away. 
the helicopter is flying up. You speed up, jump off a cliff, and get the powers of the fastest bird in the world, the Peregrine Falcon. You dive down at great speed and land in the forest. Now you need to find the old man. You have a nose like a dog. Now you can smell your friend and walk towards him. At this moment, you come up with an excellent plan for how to stop those people in black. Hmm, looking for something slimy? Well, many people tend to believe that snails are just slugs with shells. But even though they look so similar, they're completely different species. Slugs don't need any protective shells, as all their internal organs are, well, internal, inside their slimy bodies. They can squish themselves and get into hard-to-reach places, which is why slugs can often be found in the most unlikely spaces, like under tree bark, or inside tiny crevices, or at the library pretending to study for exams. Snails, on the other hand, are tightly connected with their shells and can't survive without one. Unlike hermit crabs, which replace their shells as they grow, snails are born with a shell on their back. Baby snails look adorable with those fragile translucent bubbles that calcify and become bigger and tougher with age. Cute? Well, you be the judge. Many of the snail's internal organs are inside the shell too, meaning that if it gets crushed or damaged, well, the animal would probably not survive. Still, a snail can repair small scratches and cracks in the shell with the help of proteins and calcium secreted by its mantle. Now, turtles are very close to snails in this regard, by the way, because contrary to common myth, they can't leave their shell at a whim either. A turtle shell is an integral part of its body, and despite the reptile being able to hide its head and paws inside to protect itself from predators, its skeleton is fused with the hard shell. And just like any other animal skeleton, it grows with the turtle itself. Now, koalas do only eat eucalyptus leaves, but there are over 600 different kinds of those. And koalas only munch on 30, or just 5% of what's available on the menu. So it has to be a very specific eucalyptus tree to make a good meal for a picky koala. These adorable creatures also have something in common with domestic cats. They sleep for 18 to 20 hours a day. Polar bears aren't at all white. Their skin is black under the fur. They need the white color to disguise themselves while on the hunt. The color black absorbs the sun better than any other, while white fur doesn't stop sunlight. Rays pass right through it. In a sense, a polar bear has transparent fur. There's a myth that dogs and cats see the world in black and white. In reality, they just can't distinguish some colors. Nobody knows how exactly dogs see. Some think they only distinguish two colors. Could be blue and yellow, for all we know. But they can see shades of other colors better than people. And cats have wonderful night vision. They need about seven times less light than a human to see in the dark. Now, giraffes were thought to be mute. But recently, it's been found that they make low-frequency sounds at night to communicate with each other. During the day, they don't say a word and warn each other of danger in a very unusual way by moving their well-developed eyebrows. It's likely that at night, it's difficult to see the eyebrows, so they start talking for real. While we're on the topic of giraffes, these animals sleep much more than 30 minutes a day, but probably not as much as you do. Their sleeping pattern is quite typical. After researchers monitored a herd of giraffes, they found out they slept at night and took short naps in the afternoon. In total, each giraffe had around 5 hours of sleep every day. Oh, and by the way, a herd of these guys is actually known as a tower of giraffes. Makes sense with the long necks. Seagulls can drink seawater. There are salt-secreting glands near their eyes. These glands purify seawater very quickly, and the salty residue comes out through the nostrils. Yep, you guessed it, salty snot. The Adele penguins are real romantics. They only have one partner for life. The male must give a smooth stone to the female to create a family. You could say that's kind of an engagement ring. Like humans, though, a female penguin may refuse and not accept the ring. Hmm. Speaking of animal love, foxes are romantic too. Male foxes are good fathers and husbands. They're devoted to their loved ones for life. They look after the females and even pick fleas from their fur. Ah. Male foxes improve their whole houses 
and take an active part in their baby's upbringing. Dolphins can sleep with one eye closed and the other one open. Half of the brain dreams and rests, yes. and the second half closely monitors the environment for signs of danger. The perfect brain for sleeping during boring classes and meetings. Hey, I didn't say that. Besides, dolphins manually control their breathing. They can simply drown if their whole brain is sleeping. Sea otters are the cutest sleepers among all animals. In the summer, because of the heat, sea otters spend all the time in water. They swim on their backs and sleep in that position. The babies are sleeping on their mother's stomach, and two adults hold each other by the paws so that they're not carried apart by water currents. Ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand when threatened. In fact, these guys don't bury their heads at all. This myth has spread thanks to that famous idiom to hide one's head in the sand. In real life, ostriches have to dig holes in the sand for their eggs because they're flightless birds. To make sure they're evenly heated, ostriches put their heads in there to rotate the eggs from time to time. But ostriches still have some escaping mentality. When they face some threat, they can flop to the sand and stay perfectly still, pretending they aren't alive. Now, according to a popular misbelief, Sharks can breathe only while moving because swimming helps them push water over their gills. Although many kinds of sharks are designed this way, many others, like bottom-dwelling nurse sharks, don't need swimming to pump oxygen-rich water over their gills. Meanwhile, all sharks do lack swim bladders, so if they stop swimming, they'll probably sink to the bottom. But luckily, a shark's body can't be compressed. That's why rapid descents or ascents are safe for them. Scientists from Japan played audio recordings for cats to prove they're truly dismissive. In those recordings, the owners of the cats called them by their names. Cats' pupils dilated, the animals moved their tails, legs, or ears. Cats heard people, but rarely responded. It's all about evolution. Cats came to people because they were attracted by mice that ate grains. They lived close to people, but were never tame. And yet, we keep feeding them. Birds are actually the only surviving dinosaurs. They evolved from theropods, the dinosaurs that ran on two legs. Yep, T. rex is a distant relative of chickens, ostriches, and even hummingbirds. In reality, flamingos are white. The bird turns pink due to beta-carotene. This pigment is found in the algae and the shrimp that it feeds on. You can change your color too. If you eat a lot of carrots, your skin will turn slightly orange. This will happen because of the high beta-carotene content in the vegetable. Sailors from all over the world talked about the giant squid they met on their voyages. For many years, scientists considered monsters with long tentacles to be a myth. But in 2004, the first photo of a giant squid was taken. They actually exist. Scientists have registered an animal that has grown to 43 feet. Mosquitoes actually bite some people more than others. The most delicious humans are those with type O blood. Also, these insects have really good eyesight. They're attracted by green, black, and red colors. So check the color of your clothes before you go camping. You can actually put a shark in a trance for 15 minutes. To do this, you need to stroke the nose of a dangerous animal with your hand. This sort of hypnosis is called tonic immobility that happens thanks to the receptors in the shark's nose. When stroked, the receptors send a lot of signals, and the shark's brain is unable to process them all. Now, what it doesn't say here is exactly how you get close enough to a shark to rub its nose. I'd say that's important information, don't you think? Elephants aren't afraid of mice, per se. But these massive animals have bad vision. They also move fairly slowly. That's why they can get startled by a bird or a small creature, like a mouse, darting past them. Just the element of surprise, nothing more. The chameleon can change its color, but this creature doesn't do it to camouflage itself. The color change helps the animal regulate its temperature and communicate with peers. Now, when most dogs pant, their tongues hang out of their mouths. That's why many people think that's how they sweat. In reality, dog sweat glands are located on their paw pads. Plus, there are other sweat glands all over their bodies. Dogs pant to evaporate moisture from their nasal passages, tongues, and the lining of their lungs. This also helps to cool them down. You might leave wasps alone, but don't be so sure they'll do the same. 
Bees do respect human boundaries, and if you don't bother them, they won't hurt you. But wasps are so bad-tempered, they can sting you even if you're just walking by their nest. Well, phooey on them! Leopard seals look so cute, don't they? You wouldn't expect a creature with such lovely eyes to harm you, especially since, on TV, seals were always represented as playful animals who like to goof around with humans. But leopard seals are apex predators you shouldn't trust that much. After all, they got the name after a black spotted coat, similar to the one a big cat has. That means they're at the top of the food chain, with rarely any other animal ready to oppose them. It's not that common, but there are known cases where they attacked humans. They're generally more aggressive than other seals. And they're not animals that play well with others. Generally, they prefer to spend time by themselves. The ends of their mouths are permanently curled upward, which looks like they always smile. Since they're solitary animals, finding a partner is harder, so they vocalize to attract it. They even sometimes sing underwater. Dingoes. When you see one, you might think you're looking at an average street dog. But be careful. Dingoes are more closely related to wolves than dogs. They're the biggest land predator in Australia and apex predators. They go after their prey in packs. When they get together, they can confront even bigger animals like the red kangaroo. They generally avoid humans, but when in significant numbers, you should avoid them. Who doesn't love pandas? Because they look so adorable and innocent, they've become a symbol of kindness and peace. Also, they're very lazy since they spend most of their time resting and eating bamboo. Sounds peaceful, but you better not mess with them. If you accidentally cross a panda's territory or the animal senses you're a danger, it can hurt you. They have strong jaws and claws, and in most cases, they're way stronger than humans. They rarely attack humans, but you're safer knowing that pandas are one of those animals you should leave to enjoy their own peace. Slow Loris These animals are so slow that even when something dangerous is approaching, they just stop moving. And don't let their big wide eyes and tiny nose get you. This creature may be adorable, but its bite is venomous and can get you into a lot of trouble. Scientists say Slow Loris tends to mimic a cobra. It's one of the few venomous mammals in the animal kingdom. And they don't secrete the venom in their mouth like a majority of other animals. Their secret lies in a sweat gland on their arms. So when you think about it, it's not a cute teddy bear, but more like a real little monster. The same goes with koalas. They look so calm, but they'll also attack you if they see you as a threat. It's not that they're typically dangerous animals. They spend most of their time high in eucalyptus trees since they sleep 22 hours a day. And if you came across a koala in the wild, the animal would probably just climb higher so it could avoid you. But if it felt threatened, it would most likely use its teeth and claws as a defense. A swan does not only look delicate and graceful, but romantic too. Many associate swans with true love, but in their case, love hurts because these animals could really harm you. If they see you as a potential danger, they'll do whatever it takes to protect themselves and especially their young. First, they will start hissing like a cat and then flap their giant wings. You should already be running at this point because they can use their strong beaks to pull, bite, and hit with their powerful wings. Platypus. This one looks a bit like a mythical creature and a combination of different animals. Take a look at its webbed feet and the snout. Definitely a duck, right? It has the fur of an otter and a paddle tail like a beaver. And they look so graceful when you see them swimming underwater using their webbed front feet. But they're not so elegant while walking on land. You see their nails come out so they can walk better. Also, the males are venomous. You can see sharp stingers on the heels of their rear feet. And remember, they'll use them for self-defense. Poison Dart Frog A toad looks way more dangerous than this small, charming one that looks surprisingly beautiful, considering it's a frog. But in reality, a toad is just not that good-looking. It won't harm you, unlike a poison dart frog. There are over a hundred poison dart frog species, and they all have different toxicity levels. The golden one is the most dangerous, that can take down 10 humans if they only touch it. A hedgehog has a special place in most people's hearts. Looking at this cute creature curling up like a little ball and running so innocently. 
but it's still a prickly animal that uses the spikes when it feels it needs to defend itself from something dangerous. Its quills can puncture your skin, and well, that hurts. The Anteater With their warm, benign eyes, anteaters look so harmless. They don't even have teeth to defend themselves and hurt us. But they do have claws. They mostly use them to get food, but they won't hesitate to use them when they believe you could harm them. Also, did you know their tongues are covered in spikes? Yup, that's their main tool for collecting food. And their tongue can be up to 2 feet long. It's long and narrow, so anteaters can easily maneuver it down into some pretty narrow spaces to look for termites and ants for lunch. Owls are not even that adorable, but they look so shy and clever. Plus, you'd never say they even pay any attention to you. But what can really make them mad is if you come closer and interfere with their nests. They have big, sharp claws, so it's not an animal you want to mess with. They can rotate their heads 270 degrees, so even if you're coming from their back, don't think they won't see you. Kangaroos aren't generally those animals that go around looking for trouble. But if you face them, they're not afraid to stand up for themselves and show you who's in charge. They can go after a human as if it's another kangaroo. Their arms are very strong, and they're even able to grapple with you with their forepaws. But it's way worse when they kick out with their hind legs. Deer look like they came from an idyllic fairy tale, but be careful. Males have antlers, and it can be tricky if you come too close and they perceive you as a potential threat. They also have a habit of trampling private gardens and eating what they find. They can be dangerous for some domestic animals people have in their backyards, especially dogs. Red foxes can't harm us looking like that, right? They can carry the rabies virus, so it's better not to interact with them too much, even though they generally avoid humans. They can be aggressive towards them and some small animals. They're pretty unpredictable, so be careful. Raccoons look friendly and cute, and it seems that the only trouble they can bring is turning over your trash can, but not quite. These little fellas are definitely not afraid to show their teeth when they sense something dangerous, even though it's just you going out to see what's making that noise in your trash can. And their little paws might be cute at first, but they're hiding sharp claws you wouldn't want to mess with. Tarsiers are among the tiniest and most adorable primates in the world. Although the first thing you'd want to do when you see one is to give them a hug, you better think twice. They're not outright dangerous, but they're not fans of humans trying to touch them, so they can react pretty neurotically if that happens. Better admire them from a distance. Psst, run! Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock, knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The Takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of Takahes was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. 
They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe, next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one! The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906, but on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco Forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Now, that's how the story goes. 
Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from. Hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to birdwatchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again. So what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? Jellyfish and coral. One looks like a plant while the other swims like a fish. And yet, somehow they're related. These two belong to the same family group of creatures with stinging tentacles. Ow! Hard to say it for coral, but it's actually an animal. Plants make their own food, corals don't. They're made up of thousands of polyps, which are tiny coral creatures. They have kind of small tentacle-like arms they use to catch food and sweep it into their mouths. They look all innocent and harmless like a marine flower just standing there doing nothing. That's probably what jellyfish think too, floating near them, hiding from some bigger predators. And bam, when it least expects it, coral grabs one. Biologists were surprised at how strong coral was. Catching a bigger animal that moves, unlike them, was excellent teamwork. A couple of polyps grab the jelly's bell with tentacles, while others quickly go for its feeding arms. And poor jelly has no chance to escape. Since they're distant cousins, scientists believe corals are immune to the venom from jelly stingers. Scorpions and ticks Ticks sure look like insects, but following their lineage, scientists realize they're closely related to scorpions. They can both live on liquid food, have a great sense of smell, which they use to find food, and eight legs. Scorpions are better at surviving harsh conditions. They can go an entire year without food. But when eating, which is every couple of weeks, they don't only go for small critters like insects and spiders, but for mice and some lizards too. It looks like both of them have been around for over 400 million years. Yep, long before dinosaurs arrived. Or me. Scientists think they could be one of the first animals that moved from water to land. They found the fossilized claw of a sea scorpion 18 inches long, which implies the beast itself was 8 feet long. In fact, after finding the claw, scientists realized giant crabs, scorpions, and spiders used to be way bigger than we think. Meerkats and civet cats. They look like cats, and yet neither is remotely related to them. But they have pretty long, nimble bodies, which makes them distant cousins of weasels and mongooses. They both bring their juveniles in underground dens, but meerkats like teamwork. They do most stuff together, which includes taking care of and raising young ones. Civets are more introverts that don't like group gatherings. When born, they're fully furred, can move, and are basically ready for the world. 
Meerkats in the earliest stages of life don't have senses and need a little more time to mature. As adults, they're pretty tough though. Strong enough to survive snake's venom, have their own methods of catching scorpions, excellent vision, and are able to survive without water. They only get liquid from what they eat. Civets are nocturnal, while meerkats appreciate a good night's snooze and are active during the day. Humans and kangaroos Well, we kind of split our ways around 150 million years ago, but we still have a common lineage and, as scientists discovered a couple of years ago, an almost identical genome. This may give us more answers about what we were like back in the day. Good, I wasn't around then. While the right hand is dominant in most humans, some of us are left-handed. It's the same for kangaroos. After they started walking on two legs, they got two free hands to perform other tasks, which is when one side naturally became dominant. As for the tail, kangaroos, like most mammals, have it for a better balance, especially when running. In our evolutionary family tree, the tail disappears. Gorillas, chimps, or other apes, including us, don't have it. Four-legged animals need a lot of energy for every step they take, while we can walk on two legs more easily because of gravity. Every time we take a step, it kind of pulls us forward. That way, we use 25% less energy than we would walking on all fours. So now, we don't need tails to balance. Ants and bees. Wait a minute, Aunt Bee? From the Andy Griffith Show? She was an insect? Mm, No. If there was a family reunion, bees wouldn't invite wasps. Scientists used to think ants were closer relatives to wasps. It turns out they're related to just some species like digger wasps and more likely to bees. Both ants and bees have specific eyes made up of other tiny eyes and antennae. They're both social, live in bigger groups, they're hardworking and strongly appreciate teamwork. They build nests and return there after eating. They're also both very socially responsible. Ants clean the environment, remove leaves, food leftovers, remains of bugs, eat harmful insects, and dig tunnels, which helps plants grow better since there's more air reaching the soil. Bees make honey and pollinate flowers, which is part of the reason why nature is so diverse. Birds and Dinosaurs Birds come from a meat-eating group where T. rex also belongs, called theropods. Ooh, here a pod, there a pod, everywhere a pod. <clears throat> Fossils of ancient birds are 150 million years old. They look like small dinosaurs with feathers and also had sharp teeth. But many dinos had feathers too, and not only those that could fly. T. rex juveniles would come out of an egg in the shape of soft, fuzzy balls, similar to birds. Feathers were useful to keep them warm and protected. Velociraptor was also covered in feathers and had jointed wrists, hinged ankles, and three toes. Some dinosaurs also had hollow bones. Some sat on eggs to keep them warm, while others slept with their head under the arm with folded limbs, just like birds. And the claws were similar, too. Whales and cows A long, long time ago, around 50 million years, you weren't around either, there was a small animal walking along the rivers of southern Asia. It had hooves and slender legs. The creature would feed on land, but whenever it sensed something dangerous coming, it would hop into the water for safety. This animal, Indohues, was the earliest relative of what we know today as whales and dolphins. Once this unusual creature got to the water, it was more clear how it evolved into a whale. Its relatives that stayed on the land hit a different direction. They're what we know today as hoofed mammals, including cows, sheep, pigs, giraffes, camels, deer, and even hippos. Horseshoe crabs and spiders. These crabs do have a shell similar to other crabs and spend most of their time crawling around the seafloor. But despite that and their name, they're more related to spiders than other crabs they probably hang out with. Horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes on their sides and back, blue blood, and can replace body parts. How handy! This crab has a segmented body with jointed legs, just like spiders do. They've been on Earth for 500 million years already, and their prehistoric ancestors could grow up to 2 feet. They had pretty long tails, which they used as a digging tool when they needed to get the food. With their tails, they can even right themselves when they fall and end up upside down. Luckily for us, they never evolved enough to end up walking on land, as their cousins do. Now, an interesting trio here. Tapers, horses, and rhinos. Although tapers look more like pigs with trunks, they're related to neither those nor the elephants. Rhinos originally come from North America, and the early ones didn't look like the big, thick-skinned rocks we see today. They were slender mammals, the size of a pony. 
some of the earliest horses also wandered those same areas and looked like small dogs with hoofed toes. The first tapers were small too. Scientists also discovered a little hoof mammal, here's her long name, that lived in India, which was an island back then, over 50 million years ago. Its lower jawbones were fused, and the creature was an herbivore, just like horses and rhinos. It wasn't their ancestor, but it helped the scientists figure out how these three go in the same group. Elephant and sea cow Sea cows used to walk on land, and the proof is that scientists found an interesting animal, this guy, from the sea cow's early family tree. It lived in prehistoric Jamaica and went extinct 40 million years ago. Today's sea cow weighs like an average piano, and you can find them in rivers and shallow coastal waters of the Caribbean, Amazon River, West Africa, and the southern U.S., where they're called manatees. The elephant weighs as much as a school bus and lives in tropical areas of Asia and Africa. They took different paths, but seeing this unusual-looking fella, you can somehow see the connection there. Lions, elephants, and bears! Oh my! Three of the most beautiful yet intimidating members of the animal kingdom. But what intimidates these creatures, if anything? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. How about we start with the universally recognized king of the jungle, the lion? We'll get to the elephants in a moment, but there's actually one in the room. You know, the one that claims that a certain jungle cat is afraid of the most vital substance known to man? A small hint, it covers 70% of Earth's surface. So, is it true? Is the ferocious lion afraid of water? It's actually a myth. Lions enjoy taking a dip in the water because it allows them to cool off. This makes sense if you think about the climates the creatures have to face. Temperatures in a savanna climate range from 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know all of us humans hit the beach whenever the weather is like that. So why should we expect anything different from the lion? Especially given that the creatures typically carry around between 280 and 420 pounds of weight, as well as a thick coat of fur. The ironic thing about this whole lions are afraid of water myth is that they're actually fantastic swimmers. The same goes for all of your other favorite large cats from these warm weather climates, such as tigers, leopards, jaguars, and ocelots. It's actually large cats from cold climates that do their best to avoid water. This applies to such felines as bobcats, lynxes, and snow leopards. The latter lives in places like the cold alpine tundra biome. That's a rocky mountainous area. Temperatures there, on average, get as low as 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it makes perfect sense that these big, cold weather cats despise water. Getting their fur coats wet would dampen their chances of staying warm. Pun intended. I don't think you have to look too far to piece together where this lions are afraid of water myth comes from. In fact, there's a good chance for some of you watching this video that the reason is near your computer screen right now, jumping around and causing mischief. That's right, we may have jumped ourselves to a conclusion that certain behavioral aspects of our own pet cats would match that of a lion. House cats, though related to all the previously mentioned big cats, are not actually directly descended from them. They instead have developed over millions of years from a single wild ancestor that still exists in the wild today, the Near Eastern Wildcat. As water is not plentiful in the Middle East, these cats were not exposed to it to any great degree. Like their descendants, they only appreciate it as a food source. As you likely see with your pet, they hardly bathe, swim, or interact with water in general. Lucky for them, they don't even need to. These domestic felines use their tongues to clean themselves. They can do this because their tongues have tiny hook-shaped papillae. They assist cats in grooming out knots and keeping the coat clean, sweet-smelling, and in overall mm. immaculate shape. Cats, in general, are individualistic creatures. And you may be screaming at your screen right now proclaiming that your cat, in fact, loves water. And this is definitely possible. Some cats even like to play with water. For example, drips from the tap or bubbles in the bath. There are specific breeds of house cats that are known to enjoy the aqua life more than others. The Turkish Ban, for example, 
which is also appropriately known as the swimming cat. It's believed that the breed developed an affinity for water by swimming in Lake Van to cool down. This lake is in the area the animals evolved from. Moving on to a problem a cat definitely doesn't have to deal with. Have you ever heard of musophobia, also known as surryphobia? Both words are valid names for a fear of mice and rats. There is a common belief that one particular animal that has this fear is the beautiful elephant. That's right, the same animal that, depending on the species, stands at the height of roughly 10 feet and weighs about 9,000 pounds. It's supposedly afraid of a creature that is a mere 4 inches in length and weighs less than 1 pound. But why did this belief appear? Well, the reasoning for this rumor is based on the possibility that elephants are paranoid about mice climbing inside their trunks. If a mouse succeeded in doing this, there would be a potential that it could cause irritation and blockage within the trunk. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy who spoils parties, but it looks like this belief is also a myth. Researchers claim that there's no concrete evidence that suggests elephants are afraid of mice. The most they'll concede is that the giant animal may sometimes take fright by the sudden appearance of the tiny rodent, which is the exact same for ourselves. Experts also claim that even if a mouse did get inside an elephant's trunk, the latter could effortlessly blow it back out with a puff of air. There's also some evidence that, in most cases, the animal remains unbothered by rodents and even allows mice to climb on their heads and trunks. Researchers are sure that as long as an elephant is healthy, there's no other animal that it fears simply because of its size. So, lions aren't afraid of water, elephants don't seem to be afraid of mice, then are any of these animal fear rumors real? Hmm. We're probably going to be left just as disappointed by asking if a bear has any legit fear, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for none other than people's best friend. That's right, bears do feel quite uncomfortable whenever they are around dogs. And all this despite a very distant genetic link to them. When the two creatures encounter each other, the dog has the ability to chase, intimidate, corner, or antagonize the bear. As for the powerful animal, it will instead try to avoid any run-ins with the dog. There's even a type of Finnish dog breed known as the Karelian bear dog. This dog species is specifically used for standing up to large animals, such as bears. This dog has a great sense of direction, body flexibility, and control, courage, sense of smell, and persistence. So, does this mean you can walk with your dog through an area known to have bears and feel absolutely calm and confident because of the presence of your loyal companion? Not really. Despite the fact that bears may be nervous around dogs, we can't forget their size and power. The American black bear can reach a height of nearly 7 feet and weigh up to 660 pounds. If a mother bear has nowhere to run or feels that her cubs might be in danger, it's extremely possible that she will lash out, which can only mean big trouble for you or your dog. So, nobody should ever test this theory. Instead, if you're ever planning to visit an unknown area with your dog, you should first plan ahead and familiarize yourself with the wildlife you may encounter there. Because you never know what a bear will do when it notices you and your pooch, especially given their mild case of cynophobia, which is the name given to a fear of dogs. At least we were able to find one genuine fear of another animal out of these three tough members of the animal kingdom. Weird that a dog, something that gives so many of us such joy and comfort in our own homes, is still the creature that's brave enough to take on a bear if need be. Well, not all heroes wear capes. Some just wear fur and a dog collar. Why don't we take a look at what frightens these great companions of ours? Ever wondered why your own dog becomes uncomfortable when it hears loud noises? The degree of fear differs in each dog. But it's the simple unpredictability of thunder and flashing lightning, or loud bangs that accompany firework displays, that causes your dog uneasiness. The inability to understand what's causing this deafening noise may cause your dog to tremble, tuck its tail between its legs, or even run away from home. Another thing that can really frighten our loyal pets is when we leave them all alone by themselves. This can, unfortunately, lead to being a nightmare for your next-door neighbors, 
because a common symptom of this fear is excessive barking. This fear may also cause problems closer to home. Ever asked yourself why your dog chewed up your sofa? Housebreaking accidents are typical when a dog has separation anxiety. You can't stay mad at your dog for long though, right? Your pooch will make it up to you when you guys run into a bear. The Liger is probably the most popular hybrid animal and an incredibly large cat. You won't see them in the wild. People most deliberately breed them. Lions and tigers don't even inhabit the same areas. So, a Liger is a mix of a male lion and a female tiger, and they can grow to be very big in a pretty short period of time. They're actually the biggest cats in the world. Hercules, the largest recorded Liger, is a real example of that. 922 pounds and 10.8 feet long. Imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs. And they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions. But a Tigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents, and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently, but a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth, False killer whales have 44, and their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine, you have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England, and it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So. Some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match, but in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, 
they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates, thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. But there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it, there are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? Savanna cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanky, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. You'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? Yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a comma. Similar to beefalo, the comma also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. Commas don't have camel humps, their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual-looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar-looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family, 
So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild. Lions, dogs, cats, all these mammals sleep in pretty comfortable positions. But not whales. They look like giant floating loaves of bread, which is a scene one diver accidentally came across in the Caribbean Sea. Six whales were just standing upright with their tails pointed down at a depth of about 65 feet below the surface. Scientists discovered that when sperm whales take a nap, they stay in this position for 10 to 15 minutes. They don't move or breathe. But these creatures spend only 7% of their time asleep, far less than other mammals. Usually, they either rest peacefully in the water or relax, slowly swimming next to other marine animals. When they're moving and sleeping at the same time, they're actually taking a nap. These animals can't go too deep and need to stay close to the surface. Great white sharks sleep and hunt at greater depths, which means one less thing to worry about when taking a quick nap. Plus, it gets pretty cold the deeper you go. And whales need warmer environments that can help them maintain the temperature of their large bodies. When alone, dolphins enter a stage of deep sleep. It usually happens at night and lasts for only a few hours at a time. While sleeping, the animal floats at the surface. It shuts down half of its brain, I can relate, together with the opposite eye. The other half is at a low alert level, awake and ready to react if some unwanted visitor comes closer. The part of the brain that is awake also sends signals when it's time to go up to the surface to take a breath of fresh air. Marine mammals have the blowhole. That's a flap of skin they can open and close whenever they want. People breathe automatically. Your body knows what it needs to do even when you're sleeping. But whales and dolphins have a voluntary breathing system. It means they need to consciously go to the surface to get some air. And one part of their brain needs to always be awake to inform the animal it's time to go up. Whales and dolphins can hold their breath way longer than other species. They also have a higher tolerance for carbon dioxide and can take in more air. Their red blood cells store more oxygen, too. Whales and dolphins' blood goes only to those body parts that really need oxygen. If a whale only uses its brain, heart, fins, and some other muscles needed for swimming at the moment, those will also be the only body parts that will get the oxygen. Digestion or other functions can wait. The ocean is not a place where you can relax and peacefully fall asleep. While sleeping, fish reduce their activity. Their metabolism becomes slow. Some of them keep floating in the same spot. Others find a safer place among corals or in the mud. Early in life, dolphins learn to make a unique whistle that helps others from their pod to identify them. That means these specific whistles are their names, and dolphins do respond to them. Clams have feet. It looks like a large tongue that sometimes protrudes from the shell, but that's actually the foot. And it's relatively long compared to the length of the animal. Clams use this limb to dig themselves in the sand. The blue whale is the largest living animal, and it's also larger than the majority of dinosaurs used to be. They can grow to more than 100 feet long and have a weight of almost 200 tons. That's like 50 adult elephants. A blue whale's tongue alone can weigh more than one elephant. Such a giant surely needs to eat a lot, half a million calories in just one mouthful. The blue whale's heart is the size of a small car and weighs 1,300 pounds. To move the blood through such a giant body, the heartbeats are so strong you can hear them even from 2 miles away. The heart of a whale beats only 8 to 10 times per minute. The whale is one of the loudest creatures out there. Its call can go up to 180 decibels, which is as loud as a jet plane. Almost 95% of jellyfish's body is made of water. For comparison, the human body is 60% water. It's probably not a surprise since jellyfish don't have a heart, blood, eyes, or brain. The other 5% of their body weight is proteins, muscles, and nerve cells. Jellyfish have been around for more than 500 million years. This makes them older than dinosaurs. These creatures haven't changed much, and today's jellyfish are pretty much like their ancestors. These creatures live in the ocean, but in 1991, more than 2,000 jellyfish polyps were taken into space. Scientists wanted to see how they would react in the environment with no gravity. 
the jellyfish reproduced and created 60,000 new polyps. But unfortunately, those couldn't function normally after getting back to Earth. One species of jellyfish can literally live forever. As it grows older, the critter goes down to the seafloor to become a polyp again. And that polyp turns into a new jellyfish with the same genetics. Greenland sharks can live 500 years. This is an animal with almost the longest lifespan among vertebrates. Sperm whales are sociable creatures. They spend their life surrounded by their family. These animals support one another and have close friends they remember well, even if they don't see each other for a long time. Electric eels have small eyes that are not so effective in environments with no light, so they mostly rely on their electric organs. Those consist of 6,000 cells. Eels use them to stow power, similar to batteries. These creatures use electricity like bats use their radars or dolphins their sonar. An eel can also produce enough electricity to power a panel of light bulbs. There's a small tropical archer fish that can learn to recognize human faces. This fish has an interesting ability to spit small jets of water from its mouth. Researchers showed the fish the image of two different faces placed side by side. One was unknown, and the other was familiar. The fish was supposed to spit water at the familiar one. The creature took the right guess more than 80% of the time. Every year in the winter, great white sharks that live along the California coastline disappear. It feels as if they take a vacation for 30 to 40 days. The animals go to a point halfway between Hawaii and Mexico. They might do it to get some food, relax, or hang out with their buddies from other areas. The spot is now called the Whale Shark Cafe. Some types of sharks, like makos, whale sharks, or white sharks, breathe in a very specific way. It requires them to swim all the time. They also need to move quickly and with their mouth open. This way, the oxygen can enter and reach their gills. Sea sponges are some of the most primitive animals. They're immobile, don't have a mouth, eyes, bones, brain, heart, lungs, or any other organ whatsoever. And still, they're alive. There's such a thing as a sea unicorn. That's an animal called the narwhal. Its horn is actually a tooth that can grow up to 10 feet long. Manatees, also known as sea cows, are distant relatives of elephants. Their weight can go up to 1,000 pounds. These creatures are vegetarian and need to eat around 10% of their total weight on a daily basis. That's lots of sea salad. In some cases, manatees share space with alligators, but they get along pretty well. You can even find a photo from Florida where an alligator rides a manatee's back. Frogfish have special fins that help these creatures walk along the sand. They're very useful in shallow waters. A ghost pipefish is hard to see, but once you spot it, you're bound to get really surprised. Its head makes up over 40% of its body. Crabs don't feel like wasting time on such formalities as putting foods in their mouth. That's why they taste it with their feet, which is where their taste buds are. Marine iguanas are the only lizards on our planet that like spending time in the ocean, even though they mainly live on land. They're herbivores that feed in shallow waters and swim like snakes. Iguanas use their long claws to hold onto the bottom when they need to graze. Green turtles can cross over 1,400 miles when migrating. They try to find the perfect spot to lay their eggs. Penguins sort of fly when they're underwater, reaching a speed of 25 miles per hour. More than 5 million years ago, I've heard, I wasn't around then, deep sea worms and humans had a common ancestor. So we still share 70% of our genes with these creatures, and with sea stars, squid, and octopuses. The ocean covers over 70% of our planet, and over 80% of it is unexplored. More than 1 million species live there. But there are not only animals. 3 million shipwrecks are lying all over the ocean floor, hiding mysterious stories. Many of them are yet to be discovered. The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. 
but it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived, or even better. The rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing. Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as Ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. 
Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with Parasaurolophysis. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kinda cute. People ride horses, camels, Parasaurolophysis and Pachycephalosaurus. Of course, many have tried to tame Velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost as same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosaurus, would have survived. But in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA, and it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. So we all know that Mother Nature is wise. If she blesses some creature with a particular body part, it should make perfect sense, right? Well, yeah, but still, some wildlife shots make you wonder if evolution has gone the wrong way. Snakes' natural design allows them to swallow a whole mouse. But in some cases, this cool ability can turn against them. Yes, snakes can actually swallow themselves. Scientists believe that they mostly do this because of stress, captivity, temperature regulation, hunger, or illness. The snake is pretty helpless in this situation, you can tell. If it doesn't get help in time, digestive juices may begin to corrode the swallow tail. So if you ever catch your pet snake doing this, try to stop it or take it to the vet. Okay, but what about the fangs, I hear you ask? 
Does a venomous snake have immunity to its own venom? Well, if the snake digests it, it will be okay. It's because protein is a primary component in venom. And besides, the venom is excreted by the gland in the snake's mouth. So no matter whom the snake bites, chances are that it's going to drink a bit. So the only way a snake can actually suffer from its own venom is by biting itself straight into the blood vessel. In this case, it'll experience the same reaction as any other animal. Now, think you're having a bad hair day? Hey, check this guy out. Chris was an Australian merino ram who became a celebrity in 2015 after being discovered in the wild. Farmers shorn him and gained nearly 90 pounds of wool. When the animal was found, he carried over five years' worth of fleece on his body. But Chris belonged to the domestic sheep breed that needs to be shorn regularly. Otherwise, the animal is at great risk of injury and infection. So the lives of these cuties depend directly on going to the hairdresser. Shall we talk about horns? Cattle, goats, and many other species proudly wear this fancy headdress not only for fashion, but also as a weapon for brutal battles. If you ask this bighorn sheep ram directly how old he is, you'll probably hear something like, bah. But if you want to get a more precise answer, you can count the number of rings on his horns. The biggest and the darkest ring usually marks the fourth birthday, when the ram matures enough for mating. Although animal horns may look very tough, in fact, most of them are made of keratin. It's the same protein that builds human hair and nails. Horns never stop growing as the animal ages, just like our own hair. And eventually, they can curl into really extravagant shapes, making these weapons turn against their owners. This is what a Wilshire sheep horn looks like when it's young. But as the years go by, the horns typically curl in front of its face. And while most grow out harmlessly, the inward-growing horns can end up dangerously close to the sheep's head. Like this ram who's having bad luck, to say the least. Its horn has slowly grown into its own skull, and eventually, well, it didn't end well for the sheep. Of course, this would hardly have happened on a farm, because people would have made a preventive horn cut. But unfortunately, in the wild, animals cannot use hairdresser services. That's why they use rocks and branches to rub and grind away at their horns to keep them safe, just like humans trim their nails. Faulty genetics is not the only reason for the horn distortion. You see, when males of the species want to fight for dominance, they begin to butt heads to show each other who's the alpha male here. Mm -hmm. These battles can break horn plates, making them grow at weird and dangerous angles. The fancier the original shape of the horns is, the more problems their fracture may cause. This poor African kudu is a bright example. Fortunately, in some cases, unlimited body part growth can be good for the animal. Just take a look at these adorable smiles. If you happen to break off your own molar tooth, your dentist would probably say it's irreversible and offer a replacement. But if an alpaca breaks its front teeth, all it has to do is wait a bit. Although these animals don't have upper teeth, their lower teeth constantly grow throughout their lifetime. And they might look pretty creepy when they get too long. That's why some farmers prefer trimming them from time to time. Just like pet owners cut the nails of their cats or dogs. Now llamas look so similar to alpacas that many people confuse these two species. But the significant difference between them is that llamas' front teeth are encased in enamel. That's why, unlike alpacas, they don't possess the superpower of limited growth. Eh, too bad. Unlike the keratin horns, deer antlers are made entirely of bone. Typically, only male deers, called stags, grow antlers. Very rarely, females can grow them too due to a serious hormone imbalance. This is a deer equivalent of a beard on a human female that sometimes can appear due to various diseases. Adult deers grow and shed their antlers annually, which coincides with the breeding season. At first, their antlers are covered in velvet, a protective skin with blood vessels. But once the antler is fully developed, the deer gets rid of the velvet, just like snakes shed their skin. Although this process doesn't harm the deer, it may look pretty spooky. Once the brand new antlers are ready, stags begin to fight with other males over the ladies' attention. Usually stags barely eat or sleep during this competition, 
And if you ever question whether the antlers of two deers can get locked together, the answer is yes. Every stag is risking ending up stuck with his own rival instead of having a romantic night out with a female deer. Bummer. Moreover, all the traumas that the deer gets during the mating season can influence further antler growth if specific nerves get damaged. Just like horns, antlers can develop at distorted angles because of genetic failures. Some mutations can even make them grow monstrously large. This unlucky deer can barely move his head without losing balance. Also, if a deer breaks one of its legs, its body can speed up the healing by sacrificing the bone and blood material from one of the antlers. And thus, this antler will get thinner and weaker. And speaking of facial extensions, we cannot skip the tusks. Please meet Babarusa from Indonesia. This ancient boar first emerged over 35,000 years ago. It's easy to confuse these big tusks with horns, but they are actually upper canines. They tend to pierce through the skin of the boar's face as it matures. Scientists believe that these intimidating tusks have evolved as a tool to protect eyes and throat while fighting with other males during mating season. But this design doesn't seem very thoughtful. If a male boar doesn't grind his tusks regularly, they can end up curling back into his own skull, which can blind him or even worse. Now, what if I told you that hoofs can grow out of control just like horns and antlers? It took evolution millions of years to turn the middle toe of the animal's foot bone into the hoof. And just like toenails, they tend to grow and curl into creepy shapes if they aren't cut regularly. When donkeys or horses don't have a chance to wear down their hooves naturally by walking on hard surfaces, they tend to overgrow. This makes the animals walk on the balls of their feet and overstretch the tendons, which may result in pain and bone loss. And eventually, they can lose the ability to walk at all. So if you ever come across a horse with curly hooves, consider calling the experts to give it an emergency manicure. Perhaps one of the most obvious questions regarding the undersea world is, can a fish drown in the water? Yup, it can. Although gills are an amazing gift of nature, there are still many factors that may deprive a fish of healthy breathing. When the oxygen level in the water is too low, fish begin to suffocate. But it happens very rarely in the wild. Oxygen deficit usually appears in aquariums that are not washed and replenished often enough. Also, parasites, diseases, and an overall imbalance in water components can cause the fish to drown. And on that note, I need to hoof it on out of here. If you think your folks were too harsh on you, perhaps this list of negligent animals will show you a broader perspective on bad parenting. Female horses, or mares, have a gestation period of about a year. This might sound like a terribly long time, but elephants won't agree with that. They carry their young for up to 22 months before giving birth. Unlike the other animals who prefer to rest waiting for their cub to arrive, for mares, pregnancy means party time. The moment the female horse gets pregnant, she goes for a walk around the herd and mates with every stallion. Although it seems meaningless because she's already pregnant, there's a reasonable explanation. The male horses are pretty proud and aggressive with their rivals. But if a stallion would think that a brand new foal is his, the chances that he will hurt the youngling will fall to zero. So the mare's actual intention is to keep the foal safe by making it impossible for stallions to determine the real father, which is a good mothering quality. That's why mares are at the bottom of our list. Female cuckoo birds are famous for abandoning their chicks before even hatching. They simply lay eggs in other birds' nests and leave for good. It's hard to distinguish native eggs from foundlings. That's why the unlucky foster birds incubate them all equally. Meanwhile, cuckoo birds even enjoy their single independent lives. Unfortunately, it's not a win-win deal. The cuckoo chick brings chaos and losses to the foster parents. It grows faster and hatches earlier, making the smaller purebred chicks fall out of the nest. Sparrows are so cute, but don't buy into this innocent little face. A female house sparrow is a good, caring mom, but also a furious stepmother, who might terrify even Cinderella. Sparrows are typically monogamous, but sometimes they can have connections outside the native nest. 
When it happens, a female sparrow can literally figure out the other women that mated with their partner and destroy their nests. Why? Just to make sure the male sparrow will have enough time to father her own offspring. Apparently, they haven't heard of babysitters. Harp seals are dedicated to their pups during the first two weeks, so they can't be called the worst mothers in the animal kingdom. In this short period, they keep their offspring close, nursing and feeding them round the clock. But after that, mother seals say goodbye and leave the younger generation alone on the ice. Seal pups are still very vulnerable because they don't know how to swim, hunt, or protect themselves. They should be at least two months old to learn all those skills. So they spend this time waiting, losing weight, and trying not to get eaten by predators. It's no wonder that only one third of all little seals actually make it through the first year of life. Hamsters are harmless, cuddly, and cute, right? But still, they have one dark secret that can shock their owners if no one warns them. In some cases, hamster females may confuse their own offspring with dinner. Nobody knows exactly why, but scientists have developed several theories. Some suggest that they're trying to replenish nutrients after giving birth. Others claim that mother hamsters might feel stressed and threatened by too large a litter. So this action is a self-protection mechanism in a way. To avoid this sad ending, experts recommend keeping the mother hamster away from any stress and giving her all necessary nutrients. All or nothing is probably the favorite motto of black bears. They usually have two or three cubs at a time. But if a mother bear only has one cub for some reason, she's likely to abandon it, hoping for a larger litter the next year. Why? Probably because raising only one baby isn't worth the effort. That's a strange kind of laziness. And while a black bear cub may increase the chances of survival by having a sibling, pandas follow the opposite tradition. It's hard to admit, but these cute fluffy fellows are pretty negligent parents. Panda mothers usually have twins, but they prefer taking care of only one of them. They will feed and nurse the strongest cub. Meanwhile, the weakest one will be neglected and forced to survive on its own. The explanation for their cruelty is pretty practical. Pandas eat bamboo, but it's not nutritious enough to make milk for both cubs. Even pandas that live in the zoo follow the same tradition of abandonment. But thankfully, zookeepers provide all the cubs with milk equally. Although monkeys usually have the reputation of caring, responsible parents, these little mustache cuties stand out. After a gestation period of around five months, the mother tamarind usually gives birth to twins. And if they happen to fall out of the tree by mistake, she will have the nerve to ignore her own cubs crying. Mm. Some of them can throw the cubs out of the tree voluntarily for unknown reasons. Who knows what hides in those little heads? But not all of them are so cold-hearted. If a mother tamarind is surrounded by a wide social group of strong food providers and protectors, she's likely to take good care of her offspring. But when no one's watching or helping, she can stop making any effort, probably because the cubs won't have a high chance of survival anyway. Although mustached tamarinds look like great pet material, experts claim that these monkeys require more daily commitment and dedication than any other pet. Well, at least you're too heavy to kick out of the tree. Bunnies are usually associated with warm hugs and cuddles. But in real life, they're not so gentle when it comes to their own newborns. Rabbit mothers prefer leaving the burrow as soon as they give birth. And these cute little bunnies have to learn to face life challenges on their own. They only interact with their mother for a few minutes a day during feedings. Scientists suggest that the female rabbit abandons her offspring to confuse predators and keep them away. Of course, this method doesn't provide a 100% guarantee. After all, the rabbit mothers don't put much effort into creating a safe shelter for the cubs. They usually build it out in the open. And where's the happy father, I hear you ask? Well, it's recommended to isolate the mother from any male rabbits while she raises the newborns. Unlike the horses, male rabbits will probably not hurt the younglings, but he can impregnate the female rabbit again 
even on the same day she gives birth. Reptiles aren't known for being warm and caring creatures, and their practical approach to life extends to their parenting style as well. But long-tailed skinks bring personal boundaries protection to the next level. This mother lizard will eat her own eggs when too many predators gather around her home. She won't make any effort to fight off the danger. Perhaps her philosophy is, if I can't have it, no one will. After the threat is gone, they'll just live on and lay new eggs. The female eagle lays two to three eggs within a week. After around a month of the breeding period, the eaglets finally emerge, but their problems are only getting started. Technically, all eggs have slightly different ages, so they don't hatch simultaneously. And when it comes to sibling competition, black eagles can get pretty aggressive towards younger chicks. The older chicks usually start to peck the younger before they even get the chance to start their lives, probably to reduce the competition for food and space. But the eagle mommy won't bother to pull apart her chicks, even if their fight leads to serious injuries. She would neither scold the winner nor save the loser. Apparently, her indifferent attitude should prepare the chicks for the harsh life of an adult eagle. After all, it's a bird of prey, and it keeps the habit of hunting mammals and other birds at their nests throughout life. You work in a large nature reserve that's home to more than a thousand species of animals. At night, you drive through the territory in a jeep to see if everything's okay. Most of the animals are sleeping. Suddenly, you hear the monkeys screaming. They jump from branch to branch. A herd of horses runs out of the forest. They look worried too. You hear many animals crying. Looks like some unknown strange thing has woken up and horrified the whole reserve. You see a flash in the night sky. It's a meteorite and it's flying right towards you. You get in the car, hit the gas and drive away as far as possible. The space rock falls right in front of you and throws your vehicle to the side. You pass out. The fallen meteorite emits some strange yellow energy. You're inside an overturned car, unconscious. All the animals have calmed down. Thousands of them silently approach the meteorite. Its energy envelops you and all the animals around. The more energy comes out, the smaller the space stone becomes. By the morning, the meteorite dissolves in the air. It has absorbed the animal powers and passed them on to you. You wake up in the grass near the car, surrounded by several people. These are the reserve employees and some guys in black suits. They study the crater in the ground and ask you what happened. You tell them about the meteorite and they order you to go with them. One of them grabs you tightly by the shoulder. You don't like it and you want to break out. Two men in black are holding you. You get angry and feel your muscles increase and your skin becomes covered with fur. You quickly push the men away and roar. Your nails have turned into claws. You've received a bear's powers. Now you're just as strong and fierce. Agents in black are following you. You run away into the forest. You want to be faster and feel your spine changing its shape. Now you're running very fast on all fours. You've got the power of a cheetah, the fastest animal on Earth. You're hiding in the forest. The agents are far behind you. You hear a helicopter from above. It shines a bright spotlight beam. Oh no, they've noticed you. Agents use a megaphone to ask you to stop. But you know what awaits you. Labs, experiments, life in a cage. You've seen a lot of movies about it, so you won't just give up. You run out of the forest. They release darts at you. You quickly run to a large lake and dive inside. Webbing has grown on your arms and legs. Your feet are like flippers. Your legs fuse into one big tail. And you are now a walrus. You quickly swim across the lake and come ashore on the other side. Several cars and motorcycles are circling the lake to catch up with you. There's another forest ahead. But this time, it's too dense. There's not enough space to develop great speed but you can get the strength of a monkey. Your hands get longer and your fingers become stronger. You jump up a tree, climb to the top and inspect the reserve. You need to go south and get to a small town to eat and drink. 
After a couple of hours, you reach the reserve's border. Now you have to jump over a high fence. Your legs are getting strong. You jump like a kangaroo, but it's not high enough. You fall to the ground. The helicopter catches up to you. You get lizard powers. You get sticky scales on your palms. You quickly climb the concrete wall and jump to the other side. You find yourself in the tall grass. Agents are coming to you from all sides. You're thinking about a snake. Your arms and legs fuse with your body. Now you can crawl. You pass all the people and find yourself on the road. You see a car in the distance. Raise your hand and ask it to stop. Oh no, it's the agent's vehicle. They surround you. The searchlight from the helicopter is shining right on you. You have nowhere to go. But you don't really have to go. Your clothes tear on your back. Huge wings grow out of your shoulder blades. You rise into the air. It's pretty cold here, but the feathers on your body protect you from the wind. Great, you can fly. It's incredible. Ouch, you feel like someone has pinched you from behind. It's a dart, they got you. You want to sleep and fly down, 